to Scoop and Scale, where we dish up the science and weigh facts about mostly equine nutrition. I'm Michelle Anderson. I spent two decades working in equine media, and I currently create content and help veterinarians and businesses connect with horse owners through my consulting business, Cadence Marketing and Media. I'm a trail rider, dressage rider, and an at-home horse keeper. And I'm equine nutrition consultant, Dr. Claire Tunis of Clarity Equine Nutrition. I develop diet plans for horses ranging from metabolic seniors to Olympic athletes. I also consult for equine nutrition companies. I'm a scientist, dressage rider, and a pony club mom. Claire and I collaborated for years when I was the editor of an equine publication, and she was one of our regular contributors. We'd finish work, but we always had more to talk about. New products, new research, and our own horses. This podcast is an extension of those conversations. It's for anyone who wants to make better choices when it comes to feeding and caring for their own horses. And before we get started, a quick disclaimer. The information in this podcast is general and not meant to replace the individualized advice of your own qualified equine nutritionist or veterinarian. And while I have a PhD in nutrition, I'm not a veterinarian and can't give medical advice. With that, thank you for joining us and we hope you enjoy the following episode. It's been a while since we've recorded one of these. I've uh, I've been in Europe for about a month, and I feel like we should catch up. What have you been up to while I've been gone? Uh, getting lots of riding in, lots of working. We also had our the first CDI in the Pacific Northwest. I think it's been over thirty years since there was wow. a first, first CDI, and uh, my my trainer competed in that uh, with a, a barn mate's horse. Um, and I, I have to tell you, because I just thought this was funny. I was sitting at a table with one of my barn mates that I had traveled with to get there. And we're watching the CDI and her horses are really beautiful, just like very shiny. And their body condition is beautiful. She just she does a, a stellar job with the management of her horses. And I was like, hey, I'm just wondering, I'm like, what what do you feed them? And so she started uh, describing what she feeds them. And so uh, she told me a, a ration balancer of a specific brand. She told me a, a flax and a, a specific amount of flax uh, that she feeds them and, and, and went through her forage that she feeds them. And I was like, hey, do you know Claire? <laughs> and she goes, oh, no. <laughs> Claire did the diet for my horses, um, which is just funny because she, you don't live in this area. You do consult oh. all over the country and she is from, from another state uh, that I think you've done quite a bit of work in. But uh, when I said, oh, Claire, um, she looked at me like I was, she's like, you know, Claire? I'm like, yes, yeah. <laughs> Claire. And it was very funny, but kudos to you on helping with those diets because her horses are are beautiful and, and she's done done a good job. So I'm now going to start looking whenever I'm at stuff for uh, horses that are eating Claire designed diets. <laughs> I, think, I, think I, can, I think I can point them out. Oh, that's, that, that would be fun. And um, yeah, I'm glad she's getting good results. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think she's going to be calling you soon. She said it's been a while since you guys have done an update. So I think I can see you, our audience can't, but I think you're, you're blushing a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's just because it's really hot here right now. <laughs> Arizona heat. Okay. Okay. We'll take yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> We've been tackling equine nutrition basics. And in this episode, we're going to discuss electrolytes, salt, and water in your horse's diet. Yes. And it's timely because... I just got back from a lovely vacation in Europe, which was fabulous. Came back to the desert and goodness, it is hot. <laughs> I've been living in like, I don't know, it's been beautiful, maybe like 85. And I think today it's 112 here and it won't be below that for 10 days. And I think on Saturday... It's going to be 116. Oh, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday is going to be 116. Yeah, it's hot down there. I have family that lives uh, not far from you, and it's hot. It's really hot. You know, it takes special people to live in Arizona, and you know, it can be hard on our horses here in the high desert of Oregon. We get some hot days, too, and they haven't hit quite yet, but they're coming, and we'll get over 100. And so anytime... 
it starts getting hot and we start seeing our horses sweating. I actually, mine were laying out in the sun and one had some, some sweat spots on her yesterday um, that, that I had to check out. Uh, it makes me start wondering, do I need to start adding electrolytes? Often I'll add electrolytes when I'm at a horse show and it's hot, but does she need that as part of her regular diet? Uh, but with that, what is an electrolyte? <laughs> Yeah, that's a great question. And and to your point about those sweat patches here in Arizona, our horses are sweating so heavily just standing around when it's like it is right now that they literally have salt encrusted over the top of their backs. And you've got they're white and crunchy. It's, yeah. I'd never I'd never seen anything like it till I moved to the desert. But yeah. Electrolytes, um, you know, I think we when I when people normally talk to me about electrolytes, they're often thinking about, you know, these are things that come in a bucket, right? Or a supplement container. Um and um, of things that they supplement their horse. But, you know, from a kind of a biology, chemistry point of view, electrolytes have a very specific sort of definition. And, uh, you know, they're substances that will dissolve in water. And once they've dissolved in the water, they have a positive or negative charge. So, um, so for example, salt, right? That's sodium chloride. When you put sodium chloride in a glass of water and stir it, it will dissolve. You can't see it anymore. So it's what we call it's completely what we call dissociated into the water. So they will completely dissociate into water. So you have that glass of water with salt in, you stir it, it completely disappears. And so that sodium and chloride is actually broken apart. And so now you have sodium ions and chloride ions and sodium ions have a positive charge, chloride ions have a negative charge. And so it actually means that um, that water will now conduct electricity. It's kind of freaky. I feel like a long time ago in a chemistry class in high school, we did something where we put probes in a beaker and like lights will come on it's a mm-hmm. distant memory but anyway <laughs> that's what electrolytes do like they dissolve in water and have an electric charge to them and if they don't allow that conductivity to happen they're actually not electrolytes and so you know some substances like sodium chloride dissolve completely and that's what we call a strong electrolyte and then you'll have some other um you know compounds that might have chloride in them um, let's say like calcium chloride or whatever, you know, or other, there are all kinds of things that have chloride or sodium attached to them. They might dissolve as well, but they might not fully dissolve. And so those are not such strong electrolytes. So when we're talking about sort of nutrition and electrolytes, it's really your macro minerals, right? So it's calcium an electrolyte, phosphorus is an electrolyte, sodium chloride, magnesium. Those are all our electrolytes. Um and some of them are more, I don't want to say more important as electrolytes and others, but really when on this topic of conversation, when we're thinking about electrolyte, we're really thinking about fluid, fluid transport within cells and hydration, right? So um, that's just, uh, that's more your sodium and chloride and the like. So help me understand the, I guess, the physiology of it. I know, uh, is the... Are the electrolytes helping the horse sweat and that's why they need the electrolytes? Or is it that the horse is losing electrolytes because it's sweating? Well, that's a great question. They're certainly losing electrolytes because they're sweating. So horse sweat is different from when, uh, like, for example... When I take the dog for a walk here, <laughs> when I'm sweating, I'm sorry, not running anywhere at this time of year. That's for sure. But um, my sweat is pretty what we call dilute. Doesn't have very much. Doesn't have very much electrolytes in human sweat. Horse sweat is actually very concentrated in electrolytes. So that's why I mentioned before, like here on a hot day, it's literally like the horses get crunchy. Because, you know, the sweat is so hot, the moisture in the sweat is evaporating and the salts are being left on their coat. And that's what the crunchiness is. It's literally the salt. It looks like salt too. Um, And so horse sweat's really concentrated in electrolytes. And so they lose a lot of sodium and chloride when they sweat. So that's one reason why we have to put it back in. Um, and, And again, because sodium in particular is so important, um, in regulating fluid movement within the cells in the horse. If you're deficient in sodium, your ability to move fluid around your body 
both between cells and within cells um, is diminished. And so that means your cells can't function properly. Oh. And is it true that you don't necessarily have to see a wet horse to know that your horse has been sweating? Like, are they always going to be wet when they're trying to cool themselves? Yeah, I think if they're actively in that moment of sweating, then yes, they will be wet. I mean, that's the whole purpose of sweat, right? Is that it, um, that it's evaporative cooling. And so they're creating that moisture. I mean, have you ever gotten a pool with a t-shirt on? And then you yeah. get out and you've got a wet t-shirt or wet clothes on and you just feel cool for the next however long until it dries because the the moisture in that t-shirt, the air moving over that t-shirt is actually pulling heat out of your skin and helping to keep you cool. Um, so that's really the purpose of sweating in the horse is that by pulling that moisture into their skin, it's evaporative cooling, right? It's like the heat moves from the muscles to the surface of the skin and it's lost that way. But in the, also in the process of creating sweat and the air moving over that sweat and pulling the, the sweat off the skin, it's actually keeping them cooler. Um, but um, so yes, I mean, they, they will be dry, they will be wet, sorry, in the, you know, in that in that moment of sweating, I, what I'm thinking about is I'm thinking about horses in trailers uh -huh. because I think we don't often realize how much horses sweat in a trailer. How hot it is in them. How yeah. hot it is. Oh. And you take them out of the trailer and they're dry. Yeah. And I can't remember who did it now, but there was some really interesting research done looking at that. And it, it is a shocking amount of sweat that a horse saw. And I think it was a like sort of like a 10 hour trailer ride. They were looking at the, you know, sort of sweat production or whatever. And it was significant. It was as much as a horse. It, I mean, the research was done, I think, back in the 90s when we had long format three day event when horses were doing roads and tracks and, and steeplechase and cross country all on the same day. And it was a sort of a comparable amount of sweat loss as a horse doing that kind of work it was you know surprising so i do think there are times where they were wet when they were sweating but the amount of air movement over them was greater than the amount of moisture produced and so you don't see that sweat is my point yeah. but i think if you're working them um or what are you gonna you're gonna see sweat if you don't see sweat and it's hot there's a whole other problem yeah right? yeah no we don't have stuff show him have uh, have time to talk about anhydrosis, but uh, I talk about it another time. No, I think it's really important to mention though, right? Okay. That it's, you know, if your horse is not sweating and it is hot out and like you're sweating, yeah. they should probably be sweating. And Or if they have patchy sweat yeah. or they're not sweating the way they have done in the past, like these, this is alarm bells. Like horses okay. must sweat, you know, in hot weather to keep themselves cool. It is their predominant way of cooling themselves. And so if you notice that your horse is becoming, you know, sort of respiratory rate is going up surprisingly high for the level of work they're doing, because that's the second way they cool themselves yeah. is heat loss through breathing. Um, you, you need to, you know, you need to get your vet involved and investigate that because it can be life-threatening. Yeah, yeah. So are, you, you mentioned some different uh, types of electrolytes where in the horse's diet are the horses getting those electrolytes yeah i mean they're getting all of those electrolytes from their the basic forage and their diet right so again you know these are calcium magnesium sodium potassium chloride these exist in all exist in forage um so most of those electrolytes are going to be in their forage you know the question is are they there in a great enough quantity to meet the horse's needs um, especially as their work level goes up or the weather gets hotter and they're sweating more so um you know and again they, they have really important jobs you know they're, they're not just involved in you know fluid movement within the body but they're also involved i think a lot of people are aware that they play a role in muscle contraction and nerve function that's that elect that ability for that electric sort of conductivity i mentioned before when they're dissolved in water that's partly that that ability is partly plays a role in nerve conduction and muscle contraction so um, that's really important magnesium actually is involved with muscle relaxation so again it's it's, it's you know important there um potassium's involved in energy transfer um, you know, formation of ATP uh, for 
for energy, cellular level energy. So they, they're they all in that base diet, but they all have important roles within the body. Um, but the ones that when we're thinking specifically about you know, feeding horses electrolytes that we're really thinking about are, are sodium chloride and potassium. Those are the sort of the big three. When we think electrolytes, that's kind of what we're thinking about. But I think it's important to understand that all those minerals are electrolytes. Yeah. So we've talked before that I follow your recommendations on feeding my horses. Um, most, of, most of them are easier keepers. They get a ration balancer and a forage-based diet. The ration balancer on the label says yeah, there's electrolytes in it. Is that enough for my horses, especially during the summer when they're doing hard work? It's going to depend, right? I would say probably when they're doing hard work, no. Um, I would say most of the year I don't rely on it. Um, you know, I think it's sodium is so vital for thirst stimulation. I mean, it's the cheapest colic insurance you can buy is to make sure that they're getting enough sodium. So um, I don't rely on you know, just the balance so that they're getting. I actually did a quick look before we started doing uh, this uh, podcast today, had a quick look at a handful of different balances that are out there. So, you know, if you, um, if you're feeding, say a pound and a half of a commercial balancer to an average size, you know, 500 kilo, 1100 pound horse, um, you're going to be feeding, it was between, I want to say like 3.2 and 8.8 grams of sodium per day. To put that in perspective, that same average size, 1,100 pound, 500 kilo horse on a cool day at maintenance doing no force exercise has a requirement for 10 grams of sodium per day. So that balance is not, none of those balances, I looked at five different balances, none of them would meet that horse's sodium requirement when fed at that level. Um, now, obviously, you're saying, well, what about the forage? Because I'm not just feeding a balance there, but you know, that varies too, right? And again, the sodium concentration is varies by every cut of hay is different. So I took a quick look at Equi Analyticals, a company that does a lot of forage analysis, and they have a good feed library for some basic, you know, things that they often analyze. So they have grass hay, an average grass hay, and um, you know, what's the average uh you know, sodium requirement uh, coming from, let's say you fed your horse 2% of its body weight per day as uh, grass hay, you might be getting like eight point, on average, an average grass hay would give you 8.3 grams of sodium. So you might just be there, like you might just be meeting your horse's uh, maintenance requirements with your balancer and your hay, but certainly as their work level ramps up, you know, that sodium requirement goes from what, 10 grams a day up to, um, I want to say it's like uh, 40 grams per day. So it's, it's you know, a big, big increase. And so that hay and that balance is not going to meet that requirement at that point. <laughs> so you keep referring to sodium and chloride, um, sodium mm -hmm. chloride. So we're talking about what m most of us know as salt, right? And yep. I, I think that uh, if anyone has followed along in the time that you and I have worked together over the last decade, <laughs> I think it's been, yeah. um, they have heard me say before that you know, uh, salt is uh, has been an important part of our ongoing discussion about horse nutrition. And honestly, Claire, that's one of the biggest changes that knowing you has made in how I feed my horses is delivering them salt top dressing with with their rations every day. So I had always fed salt blocks. And I think I, I'm leading into this question, but is a salt block enough? It can be if your horse uses it. Right. But my, in my experience, most of them sit in the corner of the stable getting dusty and covered in cobwebs and don't get used. So, you know, again, if your horse has that sodium requirement of 10 grams per day, that's equivalent to about an ounce of sodium chloride or table salt a day, which, you know, there's 28 grams is, is, is an ounce, right? Just over 28 grams is going to give you 10 grams of salt. So that means that that's the equivalent of a two pound two pounds of salt from a block every month. 
So those little itty bitty blocks that you buy that are sort of what, six inches, eight inches long, you know, those small ones, I think they're four pounds a piece. So you'd have to be getting, going through one of those every other month. And most people I know as horses just don't get through that much salt. So um, salt blocks are made for cattle. I mean, again, anybody's heard, you know, heard me talk about this. It always hears me ask people, you know, in the talks I give, have you ever been licked by a cow? You know, and have you been licked by a horse? You know, and it's a very different experience, right? Because anybody who's been licked by a cow knows it's a very rough experience. <laughs> they have rough tongues and they do a much better job at degrading a salt block than horses do. Um, so absolutely, horses should have access to salt blocks. Um, it's interesting that sodium is the one mineral we know for sure that horses have a craving for. And so they will go looking for sodium. And most of us know that we've seen horses licking metal railings. I had one once that licked the inside of its winter blanket. You know, it's licking the sweat off the inside of the blanket. I know. (laughs) I was watching you do it. I'm like, dude, what are you doing? And I realized his salt block had run out. And so um, there was a cue to me to go buy him another salt block. But you know, they lick your hands. They'll lick the sweat off your hands in the summer, that kind of thing. So they do have a craving for salt. So absolutely um, give them a salt block. Um, but for me, I prefer to give them that, that minimum of two tablespoons of salt per day. Or I should actually say it's, it's one tablespoon per 500 pounds of body weight. So if you've got a small Welsh pony, it's going to be one tablespoon of salt a day. If you've got an average size quarter horse, it's going to be two tablespoons of salt a day. And if you've got some massive warm blood, it might be three tablespoons of salt a day. Um, and I'm going to give a salt blog as well. So the two tablespoons is a lot of salt for anyone who's not doing that. The first time you do that, it it looks like a lot. Um, Honestly, when I started doing it, I was like, I think one tablespoon's enough. You know, like <laughs> right. <laughs> and then, but you convinced me, so so I bumped them up. I did have to start with a little bit and add it. Yeah, and it's not all at once because they're kind of like, oh, you just changed what I eat, and I'm suspicious of it. Um, but that's been been my experience. Is that what what other clients of yours deal with when when they're feeding their salt? Yeah, you definitely want to start slowly, especially if you've got easy keepers that don't get a lot of feed. And it can be tricky, you know, doing the salt with a if you're only doing pellets or something because it kind of falls between the pellets. So getting the pellets a little damp can definitely help. Um, but uh, yeah, certainly start off slowly. Otherwise, it's like you if you oversalt your food. You know, if you're somebody who doesn't eat a lot of salt and you suddenly cook with too much salt, it's like ah. Yeah. Um, but they do get used to it. It is an acquired taste. Um, and I should just stress that that is a minimum, that two tablespoons of salt, that is a minimum sodium requirement on a cool day, like 70 degrees, doing no work. That That's just their baseline sodium requirement. That does not replace sweat loss. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing. I mean, it's and it seems like so much when you first go to give it to them. So if mine get two tablespoons of salt, they get their ration balance, so that has salt they have, or and they get their forage, uh, and then they have access to blocks. So the blocks, uh, you have options when you go to the feed store. You have a red block or a white block. Which one is appropriate for your horses? Yeah, some people have more than that, right? Some people yeah. have like the yellow ones, which kind have selenium in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah so not I, the selenium one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would just stay away from that unless you're really absolutely certain you're in a low selenium yeah. area. That just, that, that kind of worries me a bit. But yeah. um, the white ones, I'll yeah. do white ones, you know, and I will admit our pony who's a bit spoiled, um, he does have a Himalayan salt on a rope. Um, in his stall um, I do think sometimes they like the taste or they like the novelty of it one thing I noticed recently that I think is really interesting um, you know we have the mare motel pipe stalls and so um, a lot of folks will hang those Himalayan blocks from the pipes it's really hard for the horses to lick them like that because every time they go and lick them, they swing away. Yes. Now, for our pony, who's a total busybody, it's partly, you know, mental stimulation as much as it is giving him a salt block. I, he's so spoiled. He actually has a white salt block in his hay tub and the hanging Himalayan salt. So that, that's sort of a, it has play factor. But I think if you're only going to give a hanging block, like hang it in such a way that it's got something behind it so that they can actually lick it and it doesn't keep escaping them all the time. Yeah. Otherwise, they're never going to get any salt off of it, right? So yeah. just 
that just dawned on me recently. I don't know why it took, you know, two decades for me to figure that one out. But anyway. <laughs> well, so I'm obviously giving my horses their salt every day and their ration, but I also have a, a bucket. We mentioned a, a bucket of, uh, of electrolytes. That's not the only way they come uh, in addition to salt. The other, the other electrolytes that your horses might need. What do you recommend, and can you describe the different ways that that people could supplement their horses with with electrolytes beyond what's in their their ration? Yeah, so you know, if your horse is actively sweating or it's you know hot out or whatever, then then you're going to need more than those two tablespoons, right? Because now that's just our maintenance. We're not sweating every day amount. You could, of course just increase the amount of table salt you're feeding. Um, because as I mentioned before, the electrolytes that are most concentrated in horse sweat are chloride and sodium. So table salt is going to do a good job of replacing most of those. So you could just increase that. But what you're going to find is the palatability goes down pretty quickly. And so that's where those commercially available electrolytes become really nice because they do often have a little bit of flavor in them. Um, and so you don't have the palatability issue, but the, yes, they come as powder or granules. Um, and then pastes are also another way that they come. And I think there's uses for both kinds in different applications, right? So I know a lot of people really like pastes when they're traveling. Um, and they'll, you know, shoot the horse up with an oral paste when they put it on the trailer in the morning or whatever they're shipping long distances and then do that kind of throughout the journey to try and keep the horse drinking while it's on the road. Um, it's easy, right? A lot of, especially if you're shipping with a commercial hauler, they may be willing to put something like a pace, but they're not going to stand there with 12 horses on a rig with a bucket of feed, you know, waiting for them to each finish the bucket. It's just <laughs> yep. not going to happen, but they'll walk through a commercial trailer and like shoot a thing, a pace down each horse's throat. So that's where the pace kind of are pretty useful. The powders can be given in feed or in water. Um, and so that's that's the nice thing about those. Again, there's a couple of different ways of, of being able to give those because they should dissociate in water, right? They should dissolve because that's what makes an electrolyte. Well, and I know it can be tempting to go, go to a horse show, for example, and it's hot in summer and you're like, oh, my horse needs electrolytes. You haven't been doing it. You get to the horse show and you'll put it in their in their water to drink. I have one horse that's super picky when we're traveling. What are your recommendations for picky horses like that and adding electrolytes to their water when you're traveling? Yeah, I have to say, I personally, I'm not a big fan of electrolytes in water. I would, if my horse is getting some feed in a bucket, I'd rather just stick it in there and not run the risk of them deciding not to drink their water, to be honest, or also me not knowing if they've drunk all the electrolytes that I want them to drink. Um, if you're going to add electrolytes to water, you absolutely have to hang a bucket, you know, your normal two buckets or, you know, with no water and then one bucket with electrolyte. Don't ever just give them the bucket of water with electrolyte in because if they do decide they don't want to drink it, um, now you've completely shot yourself in the foot because instead of increasing your horse's water intake, you decrease their water intake potentially. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's really important. If you're putting electrolytes in water, they must always have plain water available as well. Um, but yeah, I have to say my personal preference is, is actually to put it in feed. Yeah, uh, my picky gelding, it's like water when we're traveling, he decides it's poison anyway, because it's not right. his water. And then you add electrolytes because people will say like, oh, add electrolytes because it has flavoring in it or whatever. And then they'll drink it more. And he just thinks that's extra poison. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is definitely true. Yeah. I think it's worth good. mentioning, true, if you're traveling, you know, oh, you know, people always have this thing, oh, can I preload electrolytes? You know, I go into a show, can I just like fill them with electrolytes before they go and that doesn't really work like you they don't they're not going to store more than they need um so it'll just go straight through right so um i don't know that you're necessarily doing any harm but you're 
you know, potentially just wasting your money. Um, and if you're giving your two tablespoons of salt every day, yeah. uh, you know, they're they're kind of already you know, going to have a good baseline, especially if you've been adding electrolytes to that at home on heavy work days or whatever. There shouldn't be any need to uh, preload. But what I tend to see is people who think about preloading are the people that don't give salt every day and mm-hmm. aren't doing like, you know, it's like they suddenly think about it because they're going yeah. somewhere. Yeah. yeah. Um, the other big thing for showing, and I, you know, I've been guilty of this myself. Um, years ago, I did a I did a consultation for a dressage rider, a dressage show, and I asked what she did for salt, and she said, um, "Why well, do a block?" And she's at the show. It was like day three, and I looked over the stable door, and I can't see a block. And I said, "Well, where is your block?" At and home. Said, well, it's at home. <laughs> You know, and we had yeah. this conversation about how one of her complaints and why she wanted my help was that she was finding that by the kind of third day of the show, she didn't have any gas in the tank and the horse was behind the leg and, you know, her changes weren't as clean as they should be. And I'm thinking, well, given what we know about the importance of sodium and chloride for muscle contraction, um, and what's really interesting, I remember reading, um, I think it was uh, something written by Dr. David Marlin, who's a, a great physiologist from the UK, um, an article that he had written. And I think it's something like for every percentage dehydration, you see a 4% decrease in performance. And you know the skin pinch tests that we do for for hydration in horses. Yeah. Um, yeah. So let's describe that. You pinch the skin on the neck. It raises. It should snap back. How long? Right. Should it? Like, yeah. Stand. Yeah. In two seconds or yeah. whatever. Right. And it's same with capillary refill. Right. If you lift the lift up and you put your thumbprint on the horse's gum, you take the thumb off. It should immediately go back to the color it was originally. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so you don't get tented skin until they're like five or six percent dehydrated right so by the time you can really tell they're dehydrated they're already quite significantly dehydrated and so if you're getting a four percent loss for every percentage of dehydration and they could be up to four or five percent dehydrated before you know that's a 20 percent decrease in performance potentially yeah. yeah. And add to that that they're losing the amount of sweat in the trailer when you have a 10 ride, 10 hour trailer ride to get to your competition. You're already behind the eight ball before you even put your foot in the stirrup. Yeah. But I have to say, if if anyone is listening is going, oh, oops, <laughs> I've never <laughs> thought about that. Like, I don't I don't blame you. Like, it's like there's so much to keep track of when you're traveling, especially if yeah. you if you board and you're not necessarily the one mixing your horse's ration or delivering that salt block. Like, what an easy mistake to make. Um, so oh, hopefully totally. we got hopefully that client got good results when she started. They did. Yeah. And we've you know, we've had I've had horses that I had a horse once that was tying up, um, had tied up at a three star old. What would now be what would it now be? four star um yeah it's all changed anyway i I don't (laughs) it's more than i'll ever do so i don't know no it would be a it would be uh it would be a four star now so um yeah she ran the horse she had to pull up because the horse tied up cross country and and again was one of those horses that just did not drink on the way to competition and she wasn't doing she was doing electrolytes on days she worked the horse hard but she wasn't doing salt every day Mm -hmm. so we kind of made that change and I mean, the horse's performance improved significantly. And what was even more, she, she that client was doing IV fluids before and after cross country. So at that level, horses typically get IV fluids after cross country as an insurance policy. She was doing them before and after, which is a huge expense to her. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's not great fun for the horse to have to keep getting IVs all the time. Yeah. So um you know, the fact that we were able to get that horse drinking on the trailer by making that simple change meant that that she no longer had to do IV fluids before cross country. So that in itself was huge. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so we were talking about the flavorings that are in some, obviously, like if you're if you're feeding table salt or livestock salt, it's not probably going to be flavored. But a lot of the packaged electrolyte supplements are uh, yep. those can come with sugar. Are we concerned about metabolic horses getting that sugar? And is there a place in the ingredient list that where the sugar should land mm-hmm. if there is any? I think it's you're going to have to get good at reading labels, right? Yeah. Because, um, you know, a little bit of sugar for flavoring, I'm not too concerned about. And some of them actually have uh, like not. So you might see dextrose is what's probably going to be labeled as um, some electrolytes 
the first ingredient is dextrose. If dextrose is your first ingredient, you're not going to have enough sodium and chloride in that product for it to really be an effective electrolyte. And I see quite a number of electrolytes on the market that are just not concentrated enough to get the job done. You'd have to feed so much of them that it's ridiculous. They're not going to do anything. The best electrolyte you could feed your horse, and if somebody could help me figure out how to do this, um, Michelle and I would be very happy. We'd be quite, we'd all be quite well. We'd all get rich together. But like, you know, the best electrolyte would actually be horse sweat, right? Because the idea is, is you would put back in exactly what they lost. So mm-hmm. well thought out electrolytes have mirror the composition of horse sweat in their composition of electrolytes because that's their purpose. Their purpose is not the day-to-day maintenance sodium chloride. It is to replace horse sweat. And so it has the same composition as horse sweat. So chloride would be your first ingredient or sodium chloride is your first ingredient. And then you might get potassium chloride um, and, oh, and some other things as well. And you might get a little bit of calcium, a little bit of magnesium. You're generally going to get pretty tiny amounts of those because they're not really lost in sweat that much. And as we mentioned before, most of the time you're getting plenty in the main diet anyway. Um, so you don't want dextrose as your first ingredient. And so if I had a metabolic horse to get back to your specific question, I wouldn't be that, I'm not that worried if the um, if it's a long way down the ingredient list and it's a properly formulated electrolyte. If it was the first ingredient, that would concern me. Yeah. And then I guess I should probably clarify that when I say metabolic horse, for me, I'm, I'm talking about the horse with equine metabolic syndrome or maybe a horse with insulin dysregulation, uh, right. one that, that is a super easy keeper that needs to not gain weight and is sensitive to sugar in their diet and, right. uh, ha- or has a history of laminitis or, or that sort of thing. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so other ingredients in those electrolytes, uh, you mentioned magnesium. I'm curious about that because I supplement one of my mares uh, with magnesium for uh, as a calming supplement. Um, and I know that magnesium can also create some digestive upset, at least in humans. I don't I don't know if we see that in horses also. Uh, if they're already getting a magnesium supplement for calming reasons, or is there a chance of overloading and getting them too much? I don't think so. There shouldn't be. Again, if, if it's a properly formulated, um, you know, electrolyte, the amount of magnesium is going to be pretty tiny. It, you know, might not even be a gram. Um, so that's not going to be enough to really to really worry about, to be honest. Okay. And what about calcium and potassium? Are, are we going to see those calcium. in there? Yeah, you might see some calcium. Again, it's going to be a tiny amount. Potassium is going to be a little higher. You know, it might be, you know, in the more like four or five grams of potassium per serving. Interestingly, you know, horses generally have pretty massive amounts of potassium in their diet already because our forages tend to be very high in potassium. So, you know, unless you're like an endurance rider doing really long rides where they're sweating extensively for many hours, the chances of potassium loss being an issue is pretty low, but you will generally find potassium as like the third highest, you know, level in, in most, you know, well-formulated electrolytes. Uh, So there is this lingering belief that electrolytes might give horses uh, gastric ulcers. Can you address that thought that that some some people have or and why we think that? Yeah, no, there was a study done uh, looking at electrolytes and looking at gastric health and they did find that high levels of electrolytes did appear to irritate the stomach lining. I will say the amount of electrolytes that they gave, I can't see anybody in the real world actually ever giving their horse that much electrolyte. So I, I, I doesn't, it doesn't worry me that much. Unless I had a horse that, you know, perhaps was actively suffering from ulcers, then I might be a little bit, you know, more concerned. There are um, uh, s- at least forms of salt out there that are encapsulated in uh, oil and fat and that makes them a little less caustic and perhaps a little less irritating because until you if the if the electrolyte particles are really well covered in oil or fat um, they're not going to um, until you 
to digest that fat layer off of it, that salt's not going to be um, able to irritate the gut lining, basically. And that's it's going to take bile salts and this, you know, compounds in the small intestine to get rid of that fat outer layer. And so that's after your stomach. So um, that should protect them a little bit. So those those kinds of products are out there if you are concerned about that. But most horses, I'm I'm not that worried about that. So a big part of this discussion about electrolytes in our horse's diet is about getting our horses to drink enough uh, so right. that so that they can sweat and so that they that they don't have impaction colics and, and all the things that go along with being de- dehydrated how much should our horses be drinking and should it vary when it's hot and they're sweating <sighs> Yeah, so the American Association of Equine Practitioners, you know, they suggest the horses will drink, you know, 10 to 18 gallons of water a day. Obviously, you have a mini, it's not going to be drinking 10 gallons a day. So I don't want to freak anybody out that has little horses uh, and small ponies because obviously these numbers are generally aimed at sort of more average sized horses. Um, but yes, it's quite a lot of water. And um, again, there was some interesting work done that showed that when horses working in hot climates so you know 30 to 30 degrees celsius um that their water intake actually increased by almost 80 percent in the four hours subsequent to exercise that's a pretty big increase in water intake um and so obviously on on really hot days that that water intake can can increase quite significantly and and so i think that that's important to understand like if you're somebody that's hanging five gallon water buckets for your horses um you know, you may find that where they drain two, maybe you need to hang three. You know, you need to actually think about that a little bit. Yeah. Actually, my husband just the, the other day, we have one who horse that's a big drinker and it's been a little bit hotter. And he uh, he came out of the stall. He's like, I think we need three buckets. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay, okay. I, think, I think we need to be paying attention. He, he keeps an eye on the water. He knows what not drinking water means. It means vet bills. So he uh, he keeps a close eye on, on <laughs> their drinking. Um, <laughs> but when uh, when we're talking about like the ambient ten- temperature and the horse is exercising and, and they are going to need more water, what about the actual temperature of the water? Is the temperature something that affects how much they're going to? intake yeah i think some horses are more sensitive to that than others but certainly i mean here if you turn the tap on, like if i went to the barn right now and it's what is it like four o'clock in the afternoon and it's uh 110 degrees out if i turn the tap on the residual water in that hose would be scalding hot right yeah. so if i'm somebody that's walking along using a hose to fill water buckets I'm not gonna want to, I don't want to put that in a water bucket, in a drinking bucket. I want to run that hose until it cools down. And I think, you know, there could certainly be an issue, like the shallower your water buckets are, kind of the hotter the you know water could be. Um, I always think of those like metal, I always think of those like cattle pans where you have to mm-hmm. press the thing. Um, you know, those can get, the metal can get really hot in my climate. You know, the, I mean, yeah. you can brand yourself with your seatbelt here in yeah. the summer. Let's be honest. <laughs> it's really fun when you're wearing shorts. <laughs> I know. I have some hot, hot weather water tips that I want to share, but I feel like I actually, I don't have any right to share anything <laughs> related to dealing with the heat when, uh, when yeah. you're involved in the conversation. <laughs> yeah. So if you can, bra- if you can brand yourself with your seatbelt, I always wonder about the horses drinking out of those metal kind of cattle pan. But, you know, the water coming out of those can be quite hot. Or if it's sat, if you've got that residual little bit, it can be quite hot. And I think that can be off-putting for some horses. Yeah. Um, so, you know, can you find a shady spot to put your, you know, if, if you're in a more open situation, you have your water outside, maybe out of the shade. You know, can you find a shady place to put it? I know somebody who um, makes massive ice bricks in her freezer every day for her horses. And then she has the big, she uses muck buckets as water troughs. And then the horses will get uh, a big ice brick in their uh, water bucket in the afternoon. So um, those are kind of nice. Lucky lucky horses. So I I don't go that far, but I, I do try to make an effort to go out there and dump the trough and give them a fresh refill in the hottest yeah. part of the day just because it, it gets a little mm, i wouldn't want to drink it i i like a nice cold drink when it's hot yeah so and i i think it's keeping you know cleaning water frequently yeah. in the summer too i know our water gets really scuzzy and if you're lucky enough to have a hay dunker in your barn yeah oh. then you know that really gets you can get there's microfilms of oh, it's just gross so i mean yeah, yeah that's 
that's yeah, keeping it keeping track of the cleanliness of the water as well, I think is really important in the heat. Yeah. And I think finally always keep in mind that when it's hot, it's the water's gonna be evaporating. So your horse might go through more water than you expected. That's true here also in the winter when when we're cold for long stretches and, and we have the water heaters in the troughs and the the water eva- evaporates off uh, because it is warm so it's just you have to keep keep an eye on it and make sure the horses yeah. have have access uh, to good drinking water all year round and i think it's um yeah and i and i think that's also you made me think about what they're eating for their main diet <laughs> because if you've got horses on pasture eating fresh pasture yeah, grass the water true. content is higher they're not going to drink as much water versus if they have um a dry hay diet if you're soaking your hay you know so if you, that's going to have more water coming that way. So if you have concerns about water consumption, um, you know, that's something else you can do too is, you know, feeding soaked hay or whatever. But again, you know, in hot weather that has its own issues because they can get pretty gross pretty quickly if they don't eat it fast enough. So, yeah. Um, but just considering the, the main diet and what they're eating, that can influence how much water they're going to drink too. Okay. Well, I think that we've covered everything I can think of about uh, water and electrolytes. If anyone's listening, you can uh, that has questions, you can send them to us. We'll give you that email address at the end uh, for you to reach us. But with that, I think it's time to go to our next segment, and that is Michelle asked Claire for free advice. So, <laughs> so Claire has always been a, a wealth of knowledge and always really willing to answer my questions um, about. Uh, about feeding my horses. And so I have one that has to do with flax. My horses get flax because they're, they don't have access to pasture or at least not a lot of pasture here in the desert. And so uh, they, they get flax at Claire's recommendation. I don't know if anyone else has noticed how expensive horse feed has gotten. Uh, horse, <laughs> yeah. right? I got very expensive to feed and I've always done stabilized uh, ground flax. And I'm wondering if it would be worth switching to whole seed flax. I have a friend who feeds it. Uh, it is quite a bit cheaper, um, not as cheap as it used to be, but it is, is a less expensive option. Uh, I'm wondering if it's worth trying that out instead of using the ground flax. Yeah, so I guess I should explain to folks why I suggested you feed flax in the first place, perhaps, right? So So flax is a a good source of omega-3 fatty acids, basically. And horses in their natural diet eating fresh pasture, fresh pasture is about 3% fat content, and most of that fat is omega-3. And omega-3s have a really nice role in the horse's body. They help regulate inflammatory response. So, um, But they're not very heat stable. So when we make hay, we lose a lot of the omega-3 in that grass plant. Um, and so the thinking is, is when you have hay-based diets, um, it's really uh, a good idea to add some omega-3 into that diet so that you continue to get that inflammatory regulating omega-3 uh, activity in the diet. And it just so happens that flax uh, is high in fat and most of the fat is uh, is omega-3 and it's plant-based and people like the fat that they want to feed their horses, you know, plant-based things because they think that's what horses eat naturally. Um, so uh, ground flax is commonly fed flax. Anyone who's seen flax seed, I mean, I eat like muesli type things for breakfast and i don't know if any of our listeners do as well but you'll know that if you've got a flax seed stuck in your teeth they're like slippery little suckers <laughs> and they uh, <laughs> they get kind of goopy really quickly because they have this flax has this interesting trait of creating what's called mucilage and it kind of creates this like slimy stuff <laughs> and, and if you're, if you're a plant-based person you can soak that and use that and replace it to replace eggs in baking that is how slimy it gets <laughs> I didn't know that. You didn't know. I oh, didn't know. I could. I didn't oh, yeah. know that. I, I yeah. didn't know that I could use it. You see, so Michelle teaches Claire. Hey, uh, look at that, Michelle. Yep. <laughs> yep. You, if you're ever out of egg, Human or cooking advice, or right yes, or it, yeah, or if your child goes vegan, um, then you can. Uh, soak some flax uh, yeah i didn't know i mean i knew that they when you soak it it's actually kind of fun to soak it my, we used to cook flax as a as a child my mother used to cook it on the stove top and it smells disgusting and if it ever boils over it's a total pain to get it off your stove top um 
and there's really no reason to cook like cooking it like omega-3s are not heat stable so cooking your flax kind of destroys your omega-3s but it does yeah. create a really lovely snot like substance the <laughs> horses really like to eat so yeah. anyway we'll leave that there but anyway yeah. so flax seeds whole flax seeds have a really uh, hard shell and they're they're pretty hard to eat so that's why we grind them most of the time so it just makes it easier for the horses to digest them so the question becomes can they digest them if they're not ground and yeah i mean i think if you know that's what their teeth do right their teeth are grinders so as long as they crush those seeds with their teeth then they're going to be able to digest the contents of those seeds obviously it's likely they're going to swallow some without chewing them though and then those might not be so digested quite so easily so i think you could go to whole seeds my general recommendation and and i don't have any like science on this other than i know that they're not going to chew every seed you feed them so my common sense approach is i generally recommend feeding a cup of ground flax a day if i'm going to do whole seeds i'm going to feed more than that to make up for the ones that don't get chewed so i might feed i don't know a cup and a half of whole seeds a day um just a caution though you probably will find flax growing in your pastures if you feed whole seed because it does go straight through so and if you you know it's not having any it's not having any nutritional benefit from an omega-3 standpoint if it goes straight through if yeah so if you have flax in in your paddocks then yeah yeah, your horse yeah. And, you know, So we have lots of flax here in in the high desert. It's very beautiful. Right. So at least you have beautiful ethics. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, well, it's indigenous. I'm sure that's indigenous, right? The it, uh, um, <laughs> it's not from the horses. It, I planted it. It's on purpose. <laughs> so, do I recall that your husband is a coffee drinker? He is. Yes. Yes. Yep. Does yep. he have very, a really nice? <laughs> yes. Yes. He has his very right. fancy grinder. Yes. I think in his uh, scale, I think we have talked about my scale going out, <laughs> me taking his coffee scale out to the barn. Yeah. You could steal his grinder and use it to grind flax. I would probably go down like a ton of bricks. No, but anyway. No. Yeah. No, I, I know. Yeah. We have similar, <laughs> we have similar husbands yes. uh, who have similar coffee uh, likes. Um, but anyway, you could grind the whole seeds yourself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on don't you have anything better to do in your life i i was at back back before it was very popular to feed flax i was at a barn where the trainer also managed the barn and every morning she had a coffee grinder i do remember that and she would grind it fresh every day i mm-hmm. so why why does it have to be ground f- fresh every day though yeah because once you break that uh shell on the flax now you've taken away its protective layer so now oxygen can get to the fat and potentially it can go you know, oxidize it and it can go rancid. So the ground stabilized flax, the ground flax that you buy at the feed store should have been stabilized, kind of like stabilized rice bran. People are used to that concept of stabilization yeah. in rice bran. Um, they do the same thing in flax, which gives it a really long shelf life, normally six to six months to two years. Um, and it shouldn't go rancid. Um, whereas when you just grind it in your coffee grinder i don't care how nice your husband's coffee grinder is <laughs> it's not going to stabilize it um and so it's going to be at risk of rancidity so you do want to you know feed it as soon as you ground it i know some people will grind it and then put it in like the fridge for a couple of days and you can probably get away with that but um yeah generally you want to grind it and feed it right away okay well i i do feel like i'm a really um good horse owner um I will probably stick with my ground, uh, pre-ground flax and just pay that little bit of extra money rather than trying to uh, grind it every day, every morning. It's always that time time versus money, right? You pay right? for convenience. It's, it's, a, it's a balance. So, well, thank you. I appreciate the advice. <laughs> You're welcome. That's all the time we have. Uh, we hope that you've picked up a tip or two that you can use with your own horses uh, to keep them hydrated during the hot months and even during the winter. For our listeners, if you'd like to be part of our conversations, please send your suggestions for future topics and equine nutrition questions to info at scoopandscale.com. That's info at scoop and is spelled out scale.com. You can also find Claire at clarityequine.com. And please make sure to subscribe wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts because we don't want you to miss anything. For the Scoop and Scale podcast, I'm Michelle Anderson. And I'm Dr. Claire Tunis. Thanks for riding along with us.